you have these young farmers who are eager, motivated, educated, and they can grow some great stuff, and then they cannot get it to the customer. And so that's where we come in. My name is Louise Newsom, entrepreneur and host of The Makers, where we tell the stories of how everyday creatives turn their passion into a sustainable business. On this episode, you'll meet Patricia Wind. Patricia and her partner saw the gap and created a valuable and much needed platform to connect wholesale buyers with farmers in and around New York State. Through their streamlined technology, the Farms to Tables app, pickup and delivery infrastructure has created a community that is advantageous to all parties. Patricia and I know each other. We do business together, having our products on her site and also using her site to source amazing farm products to use in our infusions. So having her come to our distillery, Old York Farm, just outside of Hudson, New York, and record this podcast seemed like the perfect location. Of course, Patricia wants to start the recording with a nice sample of our product to loosen her up. How could I refuse? Morning, Patricia. Morning. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you know what? It's so exciting that you're here at our place of business today, which you have picked up many times here to deliver products. Yeah, when did we start working together? Two years now? Yeah, it was must be two years ago because we've been selling here at Old York Farm our spirits for about three years. So I think it was a year. We were pretty new when you came over. I think we just opened the tasting room. Well, we were both pretty new. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) We were. So who's behind Farms to Tables? So the business is owned and operated by myself and my partner, Clifford Platt. We came up with the idea in January, February of 2014. And it just sort of quickly became a a tangible reality. We incorporated in April 2014, and it's been our baby ever since. Uh, So I am in the operations every day, 24 seven. Cliff is sort of removed from daily operations, uh, but we are equal partners. And like I said, it's our baby. So your backgrounds, how have they synchronized to get this business off the ground? So it's almost like a perfect storm. My educational background is in both hospitality management and in computer science. I worked in wholesale logistics for a number of years. I worked in the restaurant industry for a number of years. I went to the Culinary Institute. So I have, uh, you know, product knowledge background. And so the idea of creating an app for local food distribution just really hit on every single piece of my education and my experience. Cliff is an attorney, but he comes from a farming family and background. Uh, His first degree and career was in engineering. And so, you know, he's got the logistics background, too, that sort of matches in with everything that we're doing. I think the only thing we're missing is us having been actual farmers. We had the technology experience, we had the food service experience, logistics experience, wholesale uh, experience, but, um, you know, farmers, it's a tough industry. And it's really hard to be on the outside having never done it and develop a business and a platform that farmers use. So I saw somewhere that someone quoted that you are matching farmers and wholesalers, and the quote is, there's an app for that. Yes. So in the sense of just of what you've just said, you know, and that difficulty of being able to understand and connect, truly connect with the farmers and their needs, what did you do? It's been a huge learning experience for me. I worked uh, moonlighting on the weekends for bread alone at farmer's markets for about four years. And so I began to become friendly with, Uh, the other farmers at the market. And this was right when Cliff and I came up with the concept for the business. So I started sort of picking their brains. What did they need? What did they want in a wholesale distribution operation? They didn't know I was doing this. It was always just casual, friendly conversation. But I was slowly kind of gathering all of this information. And we used that as a base to get started. But uh, really, once we did our soft launch, It was just asking all of the farms that we're working with, what do you need? We will build this to suit your needs. And it's really been that way ever since. Um, I just sent out an email a couple weeks ago uh, with a bunch of changes and features that we have planned to roll out for this year and requested feedback, input, criticism, advice, because they really know what they need. And so who am I to develop a service for them um, without them telling me what they want that service to be? Uh, Originally, we 
had planned this to be a produce and livestock operation, distribution. And then we slowly started picking up, you know, things like applesauce and, and tomato sauce and juice that farmers were making and jams. So then we had this sort of a pantry and shelf stable part of the, the operation. And then of course there's cheese and then the dairy. And then we started getting into other things like, you know, what we're doing here and distilled spirits and beers, craft breweries, wine. And so there's, there's just so much produced in the Hudson Valley that this logistics networking that we're doing with the wholesale distribution works for all of these products. In your mind's eye, do you see yourself as the one-stop shop for farms to tables? Absolutely. Um, we, we really want to try to continue to expand into locally produced, raised goods. Um, you know, we've come into some issues where we have to start really fleshing out some boundaries and guidelines. Um, you know, if the product is maybe produced here in some way, but not actually raised here or grown here, does it qualify as a local good? Um, for instance, coffee. You know, coffee's not grown here, but we have coffee roasters here. And, you know, getting freshly roasted coffee is absolutely important. And it's best if you can get it delivered to you within, you know, a short period of roasting. So we have to start to really sort of define what does it mean to be local? Is it that it's, you know, raised or grown here? Or is it that a significant portion of the processing of the product happens here? Or is it that it's got to be soup to nuts? You know, it's got to start from a seed here and, and grown here. And, and that's what Hmm. Local is. So that's a dilemma because that's part of your mission statement, yes. right? And understanding yes. truly. But in the sense of creating a business that supports local mm -hmm. and supports that, mm -hmm. that it being grown from a seed, but also kind of embracing local business right. and enabling them to become part of it because they're doing something to the product that is happening right here yes. in New York. Yes, a significant portion of the processing of the product is happening here. And so we are in the process now of saying, okay, let's really establish some guidelines for that. In the craft spirits industry, it's 75%. Okay, yeah. Maybe somewhere to start. It, exactly. It might not work, especially with the coffee concept, but right. everybody wants coffee. Right, right. So... <laughs> well, our concern is really that we don't want to bring in producers, or I shouldn't say we don't want to, but we want to be mindful that, let's say I have a farm that makes jam here, and they make the jam out of everything they grow. And then I have a producer that makes jam here, but they buy all of their raw ingredients from Mexico. And now they're able to put a product on our platform that competes directly with a jam that is really 100% produced here. And it takes away from the sales of that product. Right. So that's where, you know, we don't want that to happen. Um, so we have to start to, like I said, really be mindful of how much of the product is processed and produced here. So when you started, how many producers were there at the beginning? I mean, I know that's a rough question because it gets supposed to be like, oh, we have five. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, did it take off pretty quickly? I think that's a better question. And where are you at now? If the only the producers? listeners could see my face when you just asked that question. <laughs> it was rough. So I was doing cold calling. So like I said, I worked with farmers at farmers markets. So I had, you know, several that I could reach out to right away and say, hey, we are developing this platform. Are you interested in participating in it? Unfortunately, at that time, there were several other technology-based companies that had launched into the food distribution arena and did a poor job. Um, they left a lot of farmers high and dry, wasted their time, took their money, took their inventory. There were several farmers that we talked to that said, I've been burned already by a tech company. I'm not interested in it again. So it was a little rough going in the beginning, but we did find some that were eager to try something new and different and said, you know, you seem different than these other platforms that came to us. Let's give it a shot. So did you find actually there was a disconnect, especially in the space of people who are farming, using their hands, minds and hearts, that's our tagline at Trade and Prosper, to create something that there was a disconnect to the concept of using technology to push their product out and that, and that trust so yes and no. Um, a lot of the young farmers, and there are a lot of them out right. there, they navigate towards this. Yeah. This is how they operate their business. They do their marketing through social media platforms. So using an app to market and distribute and sell their product was second nature to them. I had some older farmers, you know, I'm talking 70s, 80s, that 
quickly said, you know what, I've been in this game for a long time and I know I need to adapt and change to stay relevant. And they took right to it. And then I had some sort of in the middle that little old school. And like I said, they were hesitant and, you know, we like to do things the way we know it works. And uh, so it was a little bit of a mix across the board. The Makers is brought to you by Trade and Prosper. Here we share the stories of individuals and businesses that make our communities. We believe in those who are committed to doing well by doing good, using their hands, minds and hearts to create a better place for us all and believe that a little sweat and a lot of sharing turns a community into a populace of prosperity. Trade and Prosper is a forum where those like-minded individuals meet to trade ideas, information, goods and services, as well as build long-lasting relationships that enable them to expand their reach locally and also globally. For more information on our organization and for more podcast episodes, head over to tradeandprosper.com. Follow us on social media and join our Facebook group to connect with our growing community of creative entrepreneurs. You've got the producers, and then you've got the restaurants. Mm -hmm. So we do restaurants, uh, grocery stores. We have corporate and institutional type accounts, uh, like schools, nursing homes. Oh, so that's uh, we do a lot of corporate dining. Started. Yeah, a lot of corporate dining in the city, um, office buildings and things like that. So anybody of a wholesale nature. What's your growth been like over the last couple of years? Solid and sustainable. So in the beginning, we had opportunities to really come out of the gate heavy. And, you know, we didn't want to do that because if you trip over yourself and fall, getting back up in the industry is, is very hard. A lot of, you know, these buyers, you get one chance, one first impression. So we really hit the ground sort of at a nice, slow, steady pace uh, so that as we had wrinkles in our technology and our logistics, we could work them out and smooth them out before too many people were affected by it and got a negative taste in their mouth from us. So we've, we've sort of continued that throughout the last five years, growing at a rate that we feel is sustainable and builds a foundation that we're not making mistakes and that we're getting a great reputation and that we're following through with the promises that we make to the sellers, the producers, the farmers, and to the buyers. How many new farms are you seeing popping up? We have over 150 or so farmers on our waiting list. So it seems like there's always new farms popping up, new products, producers establishing themselves here. So it's, it sort of seems endless. And have you seen that shift happening during this time that you started Farms to Tables? We have. Part of the reason is that there are a lot of funding opportunities and educational opportunities through the government for young farmers and for farmers in general to get education and training and even land to begin farming, which is great. And so we're seeing a lot of new farmers into the market. The issue I see there is, is that there is there are no opportunities or funding for things like what we do. So there's opportunities for farmers to learn how to farm and to get land to start farming. The problem is that other than getting into farmers markets, which there's a lot of funding and opportunity for, there's not a whole lot of support to get into wholesale distribution. And there's not a lot of support in the industry for wholesale distribution in general. So the problem becomes that you have these young farmers who are eager, motivated, educated, and they can grow some great stuff, and then they cannot get it to the customer because the distribution infrastructure is not there to support them. And so that's where we come in, and that's the, the hole that we are trying to fill. I think you need to go up to Albany. Oh, we've been there. We're working on that. <laughs> so where do you see this going? I mean... Is there a Farms to Tables 3.0? I didn't want to say 2.0 because I'm sure you've gone through 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. Maybe you're at 5.0. Yes, we're like 13.0 right now. Um, it's amazing how much it's changed. So always since day one, our idea is that this is a, a business model that we want to replicate in areas across the country. So the Hudson Valley was really ripe and prime for a you know, a prototype of this model and to practice it out, work out the logistics and say, is this viable? Does this work or not? To connect, 
you know, farmers with wholesale buyers within about 100 miles in this 24-hour turnover uh, sort of network. And if it works, which we're finding it does, we want to recreate this in many other regions across the country that can support it, where there is a large city base that has a decent agricultural development around it. Right. So this is not even national. It could be international. It could be. We get requests all the time uh, from all around the world from people that have food distribution companies or want to launch one saying, can we franchise your software? Can you come and do consulting for us to show us how we can build something like this? So, I mean, there's absolutely a need for it everywhere. Um, the trick with going international is getting over all of those cultural, you know, hurdles to adapt it oh, to a, a different sort of environment. Right, and infrastructure. So you've got two sides of the coin on your app, mm -hmm. right? So you have the producer's side where people go in and put the profile and all what's fresh and available. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the consumer side, right. which is the wholesale side. So there's two sides to the app that most users see, that the sellers and the buyers see. There's a third side to our app that is internal, that is, it runs all of our operations. So, and actually that side is the biggest. So the publicly available side of our software is really only 20, 30% of what we've built with this software. A lot of it happens in the background with the logistics and the databases and the product management and, and all of that customer management and stuff like that. But on the front side between the buyer and the seller, I mean, I really feel like there are just so many unlimited opportunities for growth here. Um, as I mentioned before, we are rolling out a series of changes this year. And a lot of these changes are things that I've already identified and been working on for the last two years. There's just so much that you can do with technology and harnessing the data to work on forecasting and create things like standing orders for customers and to get ahead of the customer needs so that these the sellers and the farmers and the producers um, have the information that they can really operate efficiently or more efficiently with. Every industry is just going more and more with technology because there's just so much that you can do with it to really be powerful. So in a nutshell, are you saying that the front end of the app is actually this, is the simplistic side of this technology and the back end of the app is really how this business is functioning. Yes, absolutely. The The front end, we really do try to make it as user-friendly and pleasing as possible. And like I said, a lot of changes are, are going to be on that front end uh, with the user interface. But there's just so many more changes in the back end that are about logistics and algorithms and making the app sort of work smarter for us that the users don't see. They don't really know that it's there or what's going on, but we're working very hard on on those things. An app's expensive to build. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, for a lot of small businesses, it seems, well, first of all, there's a couple of things. It's like a daunting task. First yes. of all, it's like an anomaly to a lot of people, the technology and understanding and work, trying to figure out what that is and working with the right people, but the cost. Yes. How have you managed that through the build of your business over these past years? So uh, I was lucky in that my business partner, Cliff, he really was able to put up most of the money to start the app. But it has continued to cost money every month. One of the things that we didn't realize was that, okay, you can say, I'm going to build this app and this is the, the ticket price on it to launch it. But as soon as you launch it, every single month thereafter, you have to maintain it and you have to update it. Um, our app is on iOS software only. And so every time iOS changes or updates their software, we have to update our software on that new change. And it's just become this, this giant game of cat and mouse. And it used to be, I think, that iOS would update maybe once every couple months. And now there's a new iOS update every single month. So every month we're going back to our developers and saying, okay, here's a little glitch that's now happened with the recent update. And so this has become a larger cost than what we had anticipated, but in the end, it is what makes us efficient. It is what gets our job done. We did also build a web platform that integrates with the app. So as a seller, they only have the iOS app platform to work with, but as a buyer, they can use either the app or they can get on a website and sit down at a computer and do everything that they could do on the app. The back side that we were talking about, 
a lot of that's on the website on a you know HTML computer that I can sit down and do. Our drivers all use the app. There's a whole you know so actually, logistics and routing are built in that way for the drivers using the app as well. So the drivers. Mm -hmm. We haven't even talked about the drivers. Yeah, and I trucks. Mean, we're like, I know, <laughs> yes. there's so, many more to, so much more to this. It's not just about an app. I mean, you, have, you offer a service where you right. come to the producer and you pick up right. and then you drive it to the wholesale yes. end user. So when we came up with this idea, we were really fixated on the technology, using that to solve this problem. But really what ended up happening was that there were, like I said, already technology companies that were trying to do this. And the reason that they did not work out and failed, many of them, was because they didn't actually offer the distribution, which at the end of the day is really what the farmers need. This is a tangible product that needs to get from point A to point B. And quickly. Yes, and time uh, controlled and temperature controlled. So it's not like you can throw it on a semi and it's a you know, case of forks or something and, you know, it gets there when it gets there. This has to be handled in a very specific manner. And that portion, the transport is actually the largest part of what we do. We just happen to have this nice, sexy technology wrapped around it to make it very appealing. But at the end of the day, behind, you know, it's like the Wizard of Oz, you pull the screen aside. When you look back there, I mean, there's trucks, there's drivers, there's mechanical issues, there's, you know, uh, people not all sorts up. of, exactly, people not showing up, accidents, icy roads, you know, freeway backed up, all of those things. And those sort of issues are not really anything that we can build an app to solve. I can't solve the the freeway being backed up. I can't solve a driver coming in late. And these are issues that every business has. So those are always going to be, you know, problems that we have to tackle. And as we grow, you know, they become bigger and bigger, but- um, But you manage them differently. Yes. What's one takeaway for everyone listening about a shift in managing that? Because that's, I mean, that's the toughest part yeah. for a lot of us in this space. So we're, we're entrepreneurs, we're solopreneurs, we're entrepreneurs, you know, and all of a sudden we have a team uh -huh. and we have all those issues. Right. So what, what would be the, something you've learned about yourself and that you've adjusted? Well, I think when people see entrepreneurs and, you know, they listen to a podcast and it sounds very glamorous. I mean, I came in and I said, oh, I want to come back and make cocktails right in my next life. <laughs> people don't see the nitty gritty behind the scenes. They don't see you cleaning the toilet or changing the oil in the truck. Or I've gotten in a truck and driven and done pickups and deliveries many times because at the end of the day, the buck stops with me. And so I have to pick up, you know, all the nitty gritty, all the dirty work and get that done, you know, until we get to a point where I have people that do that, hopefully. But, you know, being an entrepreneur is, is uh, difficult. You know, you got to really be in for it. I'm flexible, right? You give up your whole life. Right. I've given up the last five years hmm. of my life to start this business. So I wanted to start this business because I was working in wholesale logistics for a national wine um, importer. And I didn't really feel fulfilled. I thought, you know, there, there must be something else that I can do with my skills and knowledge that's going to make an impact for someone. And so Cliff and I sat down and we started talking and he was very supportive that he had the means to start a business with me and let me sort of take it from there. And we quickly came up with this idea, like I said, because it was just the perfect storm of everything that we had done. And instantly I felt fulfilled. I felt like this project, business, industry change, whatever it is, is changing lives for many, many people and uh, making a difference. And so I feel my heart is in this, my soul is in this, my blood, my sweat, my tears are in this. And you can't do that if you can't give up your whole life unless it's not, you know? So I'm still here. <laughs> so Patricia, on that, I think it's time for a drink. Oh, I know. So what, remind me, what is this that, that Sophie made for me? Well, it's a version of a Manhattan. And it's Thank you for joining me this week on The Makers, brought to you by Trade and Prosper. If you enjoy our show, please follow us and leave a review on iTunes. 
To be part of our growing community of creative entrepreneurs, join the Trade and Prosper group on Facebook. Tune in next week for a conversation with Mia Wright Ross, a sophisticated maker of handcrafted leather accessories with a passion to share her skills with others.